as a starter now. I should hope so. Can't see it. Yes, we are. Right, okay, so uh, I'll just say a wee quick form. Welcome. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, who's going to be tuning in to watch us uh, live on our Facebook Meet Your SNP Candidates. So I'm going to pass it over to um, Brother Gesser from Dundee Branch. Right, thank you very much again. Uh, it's very good evening from Kaiser. Uh, SNP BAME, we welcome you, uh, all of our the BAME candidates. Uh, we had very good experience and very good feedback uh, from our previous uh, question and answer session. And today again, we, uh, because of the demand of the public, because of the demand of the people, they wanted to see, they wanted to ask uh, the question from our, uh, the brilliant candidates from the BAME group. And today, luckily, again, we have uh, the candidate, Michelle Campbell, Fatma Joji, and uh, Graham is coming up as well. And then we have uh, Rosa Sali tonight. Uh, today, we have one hour for, for the live session, question and answer session, uh, that will be uh, going live on the Facebook and other, other main stream. So if somebody wants to ask in any kind of language, they could come up and they could uh, leave the question on the sidebar. So the main thing is, so uh, we have to we have to finish within one, one hour. Uh, today topic is very interesting topic. Uh, let me start with one quotation by the Joseph, and the Joseph said, "The physical fitness is the first requisite of the happiness." So physical fitness, when we talk about the fitness, when we talk about the health, so then only one thing's come in our mind, which is uh, the Scotland healthcare system. So a uh, lot of things are going on nowadays. Uh, uh, what are going on with the, the Scotland healthcare system, NHS, uh, the prescriptions, especially in this, this uh, the time of the, uh, the campaign where we are uh, promoting uh, the NHS as a logo, uh, the services from the NHS for the staff, for the, the coronavirus, the COVID-19. So I will love to start from my uh, first candidate, and I will ask her to introduce shortly uh, the, the short and sweet introduction of her. Tell us about what are the Scottish healthcare system and how could we benefit from that system? Yes, Fatma Joji. Thank you very much, Kaiser, for that lovely introduction. Um, my name is Fatima and I am the uh, lead candidate for the northeast of Scotland region. Um, and today we're talking about a really important topic that's what a priority, I'm sure, for everyone because it concerns our health, which impacts our everyday life and well-being. So to refer to Kaiser's question about our system just now and how we can benefit from it. I feel under the SNP government, we really do have a record to be proud of in terms of how we have made our healthcare system accessible to the general public. We have protected things such as free prescriptions. Um, we have also made significant efforts to ensure that um, waiting times have been reduced. And we are also in the process of expanding um, our access to healthcare with, the, with further investments for um, new buildings in different areas across the country and we're also we've also launched plans to utilize um, empty community spaces in order to ensure that um, people are getting access to the treatment that they need and understandably there's a lot of concerns around privatization um, of the healthcare system which could make it less accessible of course and it's basically making a profit out of the healthcare system, but under the SNP, um, both votes for the SNP is certainly one way to protect your um, our health system from privatization and to keep it nationalized and accessible to everyone. Um, so I think that's just a brief introduction I could give in the background and I'll be happy to take any specific questions relating to our healthcare system and how um, we can make it better for everyone. 
Thank you very much. That's fantastic, Fatima Joji. Uh, that, that's the that's what the Scotland healthcare system is. And uh, you know, uh, I will next go to the, my next candidate, which is uh, belongs to the NHS department, and she knows NHS services. She knows the healthcare services very well because she's she's the perfect candidate. I will say that. And uh, I will ask Michelle to come along and just tell us. Thanks very much, uh, Cassia. I think that um, just to, to let you know, I am a nurse in our NHS. I've been a nurse for about 16 years. So yes, it feels like I very much do belong to the NHS. Uh, any uh, healthcare professionals that are watching or uh, people who have had a lot of healthcare and they've seen the same faces, uh, shifts can be long as part of what we do, as part of that duty and care that we end up doing. Um, but for me, um, the NHS is particularly precious because I've seen it in action myself. Um, I know the extra hours that we all do, the things we do above and beyond our duty, not just because it's looking after people, but it's because we care for the people. And that's, in essence, a huge part of what, what is part of our NHS. And I think that that has been recognised by um, our Scottish government in the one-off thank you payment, the £500 that went to our, our, our staff in our NHS. And also the fact that it went to part-time staff and it went to social care staff as well is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, one of the big things that brought me into politics was actually campaigning and chomping the bit at the candidate in my local area at that time, which is the, the current MP, Gal Newlands, about nurses' pay. And so for me, there's something that I am really proud of that the leadership from Nicola Sturgeon has shown um, is the, the, the single biggest uh, single year payment uh, increase offered of 4% for, for staff in our NHS, those that are, those are in the agenda for change, um, that, you know, payment bans, that to have that offer on the table is absolutely superb. Um, you know, it's the, the real genuineness that she, she sees and understands that it's been difficult. And that payment is actually higher for people who are lower paid that are within Agenda for Change as well. And I think that that isn't being spoken about enough as well. You're talking over 5%. It's huge. What a difference that makes. I know that there's a lot of progress to be discussed around inflation and the cost over the years. And I could go on and on about um, sort of some of what I personally believe and having spoken to people in the NHS, the failings of Agenda for Change, um, and that it hasn't quite reached the mark as well. Um, so these are small nuanced factors that have been there for a long time that I'm glad to see that the SNP and the Scottish Government under the SNP's um, management and control um, is making that difference. And the best way in, for us to have that progress is to have a majority in the Parliament so that we can be focused on the task of delivering for our NHS instead of the politicising that can happen because of the, the fact that they need to pick at each other for votes, um, which I think that sometimes NHS can be utilised as a political football, uh, which I completely disagree with. Um, I think that it's very frustrating. And we've seen um, the mental health tag has been used quite a lot, in particular in this campaign. Uh, people are going heavy on it. However, there's not been recognition of things such as the third sector organisations that are doing some of the wonderful things that they're, you know, they're looking for these services to be a part of our NHS. The signposting is just as important. Um, you know, so when we're talking about health, we can't just talk about it in illness. We need to talk about it in well-being. Um, and part of the First Minister's yes. speech that she spoke about, sorry, I know, I know I went on a... a <laughs> onto a conversation, but I'm just wanting to finish and say that, you know, in, in part with what she spoke about yesterday was about the, the need for that serious leadership, about the saving lives, protecting health and uh, safeguarding the NHS, you know, by having more staff, by, you know, making that protection of the 10% increase in the number of people on waiting lists being seen in that first year, to having a fast track, uh, cancer care, a diagnostic centre in every health board area. These are absolutely whacking uh, investments for our NHS and it should give confidence to the public that we are the best people and the SNP are the best people to deliver that. And if I'm an MSP with them, by delivering with both votes SNP, I will absolutely support anyone who comes to my door with a need. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, see, everybody want, wanted to uh, hear more and more from you the way you talk, 
like I don't want to say, okay, just just stop, but I want to listen more and more. But because of this is a scheduled program, we need to look into the, the one hour time as well. Uh, there are so many questions, we will we'll carry on with that. And there are questions for you, Michelle, as well. So uh, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, uh, the raise, uh, the pay raise in the NHS staff, that is the fantastic thing which has been done by the Nicola Sturgeon government. And, and the old staff is very uh, admiring and they're very cheer up on this uh, the particular action by the, by the Scottish government. Uh, we, we have Rosa Saleh, uh, which is a standing election for the for the Glasgow city. So, uh, uh, Rosa, I welcome you again. And uh, would you like to just short introduction, so short and sweet as you are, so short and sweet. And what do you think? Our our you know the our community, the BAME community, they are getting the all the benefits of the COVID vaccine. Are they have been deprived? or they have been ignored? Are you quite satisfied with these services? Um, thanks for like having me. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm an expert on the NHS, but I can speak about like what we're doing um, as a policies. Um, I mean, there is like concerns from ethnic minorities that I've spoken with that about the vaccination and, uh, you know, uh, that maybe like the, the main concerns is that oh that I might not have children things like they just have like different concerns and I think um from like my perspective like reassure them that you know this vaccine's actually to uh, make sure that the coronavirus does not spread you're protected and I think we just have to advocate that more for ethnic minorities and their concerns and I think everybody here would know uh, sometime with ethnic minorities um uh, it's kind Know, sometimes difficult there's language barriers they don't understand the uh the about the vaccination and we just need to uh, make sure that uh they are aware um of why they need to take the vaccination um i mean within our um party like we want to nationalize uh, the care service i think also we need to talk about the positive uh i don't know how much has been um, mentioned by michelle about um uh, about the nhs and um, so i just joined you um but like we making sure that four percent uh there's a pay rise for nhs staff and i think no other country in the united kingdom has been given uh, such offer to nhs staff and i think that's really bold and progressive uh, for our NHS staffs and it's not just applause you know uh, clapping for their effort and what they have done uh, through the pandemic but actually make sure that they do receive the pay that they deserve um, I mean within uh, the SMP are doing more in relation to uh, reducing suicide rate uh, the Suicide uh, Prevention Act plan has been very helpful. And uh, there's many um, investments in mental health as, as, as uh, I don't know, have been mentioned. So suicide prevention, these are all been investment by the Scottish National Party, um, uh, you know, staff uh, receiving training, um, things like that as required, has already been implemented practically within uh, our NHS. Um, yeah. And also like donors, I think um, uh, the increase in um, donation, uh, uh, like organ donation is increased within our uh, recently because of the Scottish National Party for implementing uh, policies for that. Um, so yeah, um, I'm more than happy to talk about further later on. Thank you for uh, thank you, Rosa. Thank you. That was that was very, very good intro. Uh, uh, see, nowadays, uh, my question is particularly to the Fatima Joji, uh, who is a ideal and very and uh, the top candidate in north east of Scotland. So the question is regarding the because see in the the NHS are the medical or paramedical students are they uh, getting a lot of uh, experience? In the NHS, are they have uh, getting the same opportunity job-wise in the NHS? Because there's always complaining about the, the lack of staff or doctors and nurses. So how do you deal with that? 
Thank you for that question. Um, I'll just have to say that I'm not a health professional, but I would be delighted to speak to paramedics who are concerned about what you've just raised just now, because it will require working together, making decisions and enacting policies that actually work for paramedics. Um, I'll have to say that the NHS staff that we have are valuable to our COVID recovery, and that does include paramedics. That includes everyone from our carers to our nurses and to our doctors. And um, in situations where we might have these concerns that um, our paramedics are not having um, the support that they need, the support that they require, um, I would absolutely um, advocate for a better dialogue between um, the health workers and also the decision making bodies, which are the government. And um, so specifically, I haven't spoken to um, paramedics, so I don't think I'll be able to give them a very um, strong answer on this unfortunately, but I would be willing to sit down and discuss um, these issues because, to be honest, I know more about what carers experience or what nurses experience, but no paramedics, um, I would like to learn more about that personally. That's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, see, uh, we got the one question for the for the candidate, especially I will, I will refer to uh, Michelle. What can we do to change NHS to better help BIM community? Well, it's a very good question, and it's something that has uh, always, uh, in the time that I've been in the NHS, it's always sort of taken steps and strides forward. Um, I think that having more visual um, support, people knowing that there is interpretation services, for example, there's also opportunities where technology has really helped with that aspect, where iPads, for example, can give instantaneous support for language barriers, um, which helps. Like I've been there myself where I've had an individual who's very distressed by either their pain or their illness uh, that they're experiencing that time. And that language, language barrier makes it so much more difficult for you to be able to help that person, adds to your stress as a professional, but also for that individual who's just seeking for reassurance when they're really feeling very vulnerable. So that's where uh, innovative thinking and utilizing um, you know, technologies really makes a difference. Um, something that the Scottish Government has, uh, but that our, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has has committed to, and this is because she's been there, she's been our Health Minister, she understands, and in the past year in particular, she's seen absolutely every aspect of what is going on in our healthcare. Um, she has said that, that um, should the SNP be re-elected into office, that there will be an investment of at least half of the total budget uh, for the frontline NHS into community and primary care. I feel that this is particularly relevant for uh, BAME communities um, because that is the front line. This is your staff that are going to be treading your streets, knows the different types of communities that are there, um, your district nurses, you know, those engagements where there is a lack of engagement so that there can be that discussion you know, where that is required as to how do we further have that access and support. Another thing that I would say is really important with that is collaborative working, which is working with carers, paid carers and unpaid carers, um, and also working with third sector organisations. Um, we need to have, uh, we do do collaborative working, but miscommunication can often be a failure where the things that, that you know are nuanced and end up in the press. And it's terrible that these circumstances occur. We are only human at the end of the day and human error will occur in any system when it's trying to help so many people. Uh, but it's about how we have those localised connections, because the type of connections that I will have uh, in communities across in Renfrewshire, because that's where I am based at the moment, versus those that are in Verclyde, versus those that are over in the northeast of Scotland, those that are in Glasgow, which is obviously just next door to, to Renfrewshire, but those different communities are going to be very different and, and will need a tailored approach. And that is something that I feel that this investment will make a huge difference. I hope that helps in the question. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Another question, which is, you know, we have been suffering from the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, the most of the, the people, they, uh, they got the mental problem, mental health issues. So how can we protect mental health of the care professional? So this is, this is the question, basically, you know, the NHS staff or members, they are keep working on it and they are trying hard. So how can we ensure that must be uh, some support for them? So how can we do that? The people who've been suffered by the mental health, keep working, keep giving you services, keep uh, working day and night for you. 
So how can we protect them? So who's going to take this answer? Okay. I've asked Star and I will make it really short and if uh, the, the other folk want to come in just purely because I'm working around individuals who are experiencing this and this is this was pre-COVID as well because of some of the pressures uh, that we face in, in the work that we do and um, you know it's I mean I to work in an intensive care unit is, is so tough to work in an inpatient acute experience is incredibly tough and um, that's the experience that I've always had has worked in acute care um, and the resilience that you build at one point or another, when you're dealing with very difficult cases, it does pile on to you. And there's cases that I will carry for the rest of my life. There's, there's no doubt in that. There's deaths that have happened that will stick with me. It changes you as a person. And the experiences that our healthcare professionals have had to face in the past year will change them. There's no dispute in that. But what we can do is ensure, what I, what I call is key, and, and this whole factor is that we have to ensure that the resources to do your job well, uh, to do it to the best of your ability, to ensure that that collaborative working is effective so that it's not just a strain as on one person and to feel valued and invested in, be it in training, um, be it in career progression, in your pay, and most importantly, post-COVID is ensuring um, services such as counselling, which is there just now. The Scottish Government have ensured, the SNP made sure that that service has been there through the pandemic. But while you're in the middle of the throes of dealing with a, with a crisis, it isn't always a time when you feel like you can deal with the issue. It will be after that point in time that these things will sometimes sit there. So it's important that we listen and we react as a government to those needs as and when they occur. So that would be just some of the points I would make. I'm sure that the other candidates have views as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I think that's, that's the, the more concise uh, answer of that question. Rosa, my, again, other question is, see if somebody is a, is a layman, like he doesn't know what are the, uh, uh, the funds or what are the, uh, the facilities he can avail from the uh, Scottish healthcare uh, the system. So, how could you tell like can you get the the free medication or free prescriptions or free treatment for a I lay mean, layman how can you guide him yeah i mean i mean uh, like everybody in scotland receives free prescriptions and i think we should be proud of that policy and uh, like ethnic minorities um do get that when they go to the pharmacy or their gp and you know that is something that is given uh, uh, thanks to our Scottish government. Um, so it was that in relation to mental health, your question, or was it in relation to counselling for ethnic minorities? No, this is this is this is not the counselling. This is just simple question. Is like if somebody came to this country like immigrant or refugee. Mm -hmm. Well, they they spend their life here and they don't know what are the facilities they can avail from the hospital, mm -hmm. from the from the GP, from the doctors. The first, yeah, the first contact would be the GP. Um, so they would be uh, signing up, registering with a GP local area, um, and basically they will visit that GP and doctor, and then uh, they will be seen by the GP, um, and you know they would uh, bas basically look at their health condition, if they're traumatized, if they need mental health, uh, uh, if they have mental health issues, if they need preferring to a specialist. Uh, so all of that will be illustrated with that GP, uh, and that's why it's so crucial that uh, people who come to this country that they, they register. Um, and they have a local GP that they can see. Um, from my understanding, there's been uh, a lot of investment uh, made by the Scottish government. Uh, I think roughly it was uh, 1 billion uh, for um, just uh, for the first time, I think this year, just 1 billion. And now they have invested over 150 million for the next five years, they're hoping. So the service is there uh, for, um, people to uh, reach these services, if it's a counseling, if it's a specialist, um, like uh, child psychology also has doubled um, um, in the 10, um, uh, the, the 10 years. So 
uh, children can actually be seen uh, much quicker um, and they're trying to uh, prevent mental health for young people and I think these are uh, a really good move that we're trying to help uh, uh, young people at a young age that, that they need that service. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, yes, Farah, do you have any questions for the candidates? Of course I do. I always have questions. <laughs> um, so what I found through my um, community work that I do is many women who come over to Scotland or you know, who choose to make Scotland their home, they're often unsure about what help and support is available to them. Mm -hmm. Could you please expand on what has SNP done to help young families and for obviously first time mothers? So this isn't, uh, this is the, the, the people that I tend to help, they are from ethnic minority communities, but I believe that, you know, there are still, this information is still suitable for, um, everybody in Scotland. So can you please elaborate on what has the SNP done um, to help young families um, and first time mothers and what commitments have we seen over the last week from um, Nicola Sturgeon that if the SNP were to be re-elected, what can we look forward to? Is that question for every yeah. candidate or just yeah, any I mean I mean, can I just come in in relation to every child in Scotland, uh, regardless of uh, where they come from, um, should have, you know, the best start in life. And I think that's the Scottish government have put the baby box um, as a message of fairness and opportunity and everybody can actually receive the baby box. Um, and I think that's a, a really bold move only in Scandinavian countries. Uh, this is actually being implemented. And now in, um, I think in Ireland now, they've uh, actually implemented this as well and they've looked into Scottish model. Um, and I think that is uh, every family will be receiving that. Uh, so yeah, I think the baby box uh, has been a scheme that has been very positive uh, since uh, 2017 uh, it started um, and many uh, families have received this and there's been a positive message from mothers and families, uh, you know, the child having the best start in life. Uh, I would say the baby box has been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I can add to that. Um, I'll just say that if, um, so from a public health perspective, if I'm looking at generational inequality, um, a lot of that comes, we have a lot of generational inequality when it comes to finances and inequality in wealth can really impact the kind of services, healthcare services you achieve. So if I can just refer back to what I learned when I was doing my course in international development and looking at the kind of support that, the impact that poverty had, on your health choices and your health progression. And the fact that we have the SNP, as Rosa mentioned, um, creating policies and making commitments that um, seek to address poverty in the first instance and give everyone an equal start to life. So we have those kind of things. And I think it's important that the SNP has made measures that intervene from childhood because a lot of, the, of, a lot of health issues can be acquired um, if they're not um, generational or if they're not circumstantial. So a lot of them which can be acquired health issues. And the SNP recognises that and policies that we do have that include, um, we're seeing a doubling of the child payment, which can certainly help in terms of um, ensuring that children are given a healthy start to their life. Um, we've seen the First Minister um, pledge to abolish charges um, of non-residential care to ease the financial pressure on those accessing care. Um, she's also like announced a revolution, revolution, revolutionary, always get tongue tied when I say that word. <laughs> she's also um, announced a revolutionary um, new fund that will cover the unavoidable expenses of families with a child or a young person in hospital. And um, this would be an animal, annual investment of 5 million because we've also got to recognize that they transport to and from hospital, the, um, sit, the decisions to remain close to the young child, that does require a lot of expenses. And um, so a lot of the support that you're seeing from the SNP is financial, which is important in order for, um, for young people and young families to be able to ensure that, um, they are, that they're able to receive the care at a standard that is required. So um, I think I'll just stop there for that one in particular. 
Yeah. If I could just come in and add on to that, if that's all right, Cassie, just because, see, that's there's that much SMP goodness in this one that all three of us are able to offer it something different. And that just shows you the power of what the SMP will do when it has opportunity to create change, because we are a party of government. Unfortunately, we're forced to be a party of mitigation because of Tory austerity and Tory policies, which impact that level of poverty on our communities. And that includes in particular up to 40% more individuals that are from BAME backgrounds uh, that we'd seen from the, the reports recently, uh, which uh, was clear, I think, that had um, had made that publication. But obviously the Poverty Alliance as well has, has recognised that. So, you know, as much as everything that we're doing uh, is to make a difference, yes, it will only have limitation because without our independence and having the full fiscal ability to be able to, uh, you know, for the full circle of it, I suppose, for us to be able to have economic development for us to then to decide where we're going to take the, that money in, in public expenditure and spend it rather than finding out what our pocket money is and how we best deal with it is in essence what we're having to do um, you know there's things such as the the, the best start grant as well and um, you know where we do have devolved powers we are utilizing them to our utmost you know to be able to see a, a woman and a child through pregnancy uh, you know for that birth through early learning and then into school uh, to ensure that, you know, where people have the greatest need, that child will be given the greatest opportunity to have an equal and fair foot in. So it goes from birth with the baby box all the way through all those progressive steps. And absolutely anyone who's in that circumstance should reach out to ensure if you don't understand how to access that, we will help you access that. You know, you don't need to worry about these things. There are things that are out with our control, such as not having the full ability within our social, social security. And, um, you know, I can go on and have a rant about the impact of universal credit onto family tax credits, but we'd be here all day long. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is I'm here to promote why the SNP is right for you and why you should give both your votes to the SNP. There's no such thing as perfect, but my goodness, are we doing absolutely worlds of good to actually storm and make a difference when it comes to eradicating poverty, because it's not good enough just to lower it. We need to have focus to eradicate it and ensure that any person that makes Scotland their home, they know that they are gonna have the best opportunities to bring their families up and that the, the next generation will have an even better opportunity beyond that to not only better themselves, but also to give back to that community that has shown them such support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, that was a very good, good good answer for this question and detailed answer. Uh, this is what the Scottish uh, National Party is, who look after the mothers, who look after the parents, who look after the, the newborn baby. And uh, this is what the, the NHS, and this is what the government is, is in looking after you. Uh, my question is, see, uh, because of the COVID, the hospitals, uh, they don't have enough space if they are dealing with the COVID patients. So there is a deadlock in, in, the, in the general appointments or any surgeries. So do you know any, any plan, the post-COVID plan, how they're going to deal with this? How they're going to tackle with the, with the deadlock of the appointments or surgeries? Well, that's already been sort of looked at, to be honest. Um, when we realised, I mean, to be honest, this time a year ago, we were having to have some really serious and concerning um, conversations. I, I'm obviously a counsellor over in Renfrewshire, and you know, I'm, I was part of the, I, I'm part of the emergencies board where we were having to consider the potentially projected. Uh, you know, travesty that, that could have came with COVID-19, you know, like the, the potential death rates, the potential of how how many cases, how, you know, were we going to be over, you know, the demand, was it going to overflow our system? And that's why we had uh, NHS Louisa Jordan there, because in case we needed that overflow. Now, I am never been more grateful that we've not required to utilise that. But what we did do when we started to understand by this is that we started utilising that resource in order for people to be able to attend to get scans done, for us to start dealing with that backlog. So it's already started um, for, for that. Also, what COVID has taught us is ways in which we can be more creative uh, with digital appointments 
to allow for more consultations to take place. And it's also more accessible uh, for us to have those options as well. And these are things that should continue to be in place. Now, there will be people who will still prefer the traditional appointment, going into the hospital, etc. Uh, and I'm not saying that we should get rid of that. I'm saying this is an add-on because we should be as inclusive as possible within the care that we deliver. It's also helpful for, see, for example, if you're, if you're caring for someone who um, is, is very limited because of the disability that they have, um, you know, and you're, it's, it's a lot for you to then to be able to get that individual to the hospital because they maybe need ambulance, a day ambulance support to collect the individual. If it's something that's small that you think, oh, I don't want to create that level of distress, they are not keen themselves to get seen. Imagine the impact of just being able to turn the camera around to let whichever professional it is, somebody that knows that person's care really well, see what that issue is, to be able to then just assist that carer to take that stress away. To me, that is something that is absolutely superb and we should absolutely invest and making that difference so that where we do need those really urgent services can be better resourced, it would be a better resource spent uh, to where that really is required. Uh, what will be the SNP do for the unpaid carers? What is SNP stands for that? What did you hear the question? Was that for Fatima or was it for myself or was it just a general question? Sorry, I wasn't sure. <laughs> for the Fatima, please. Okay, yep. sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't hear the name. So um, for carers, you know, um, if we look at what's happened in the past, we've seen a consistent clap for carers and the Tory is refusing to give um, NHS staff in England um, more than 1%. But in Scotland, we've gone Further than that, we've gone with 4% and this does include carers and um, the pay offer um, is backdated to December 2020. Um, so anyone on a salary before, um, sorry, a salary below 25,000 um, will receive an increase of more than a uh, thousand pounds. And um, this offer would mean that in Scotland, um, a porter and um, healthcare assistants and nurses and paramedics um, would be around 2,000 better off um, than their counterparts in England. So um, the thank you payment, I think we've already mentioned this before as well, um, that the thank, 500 pound thank you payment is also a bonus that's delivered to health and care staff. So we are, um, we do recognize the um, importance of all healthcare staff in our NHS. And there's been so much support that's been pledged or delivered in order to ensure that our care workers are not left behind because every job is valued in the NHS. So. And um, those are just some of the pledges that have been made or delivered. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, what do you think, like, uh, what the SNP innovation for the national care services, what the SNP propose, what is that? Well, um, that is something that I'm, another thing that I'm incredibly proud of. Um, so I'm part of the Social Justice and Fairness Commission, uh, where we're looking at um, sort of how, how best an independent Scotland can serve the people of Scotland. Um, now for me, um, the National Care Service is about integration and joint work. And I know I've said it a couple of times today, but genuinely needs that. Um, now this is about respect for the third sector organisations for uh, where there is, uh, you know, it's, there's things like private care where there's care homes. Um, you know, it's, it's a very convoluted, tangled web but the carers that are in these places delivering that care want the best for those individuals that they're caring for. And so if there was consistent service, if there's a consistent approach to policy of what is expected of a standard um, and also for protect, protection of staff for their pay, for their working terms and conditions, uh, for the investment in them for their training and career progression, because these are all the things that I have said are really important that are, are required. Um, these having that in, under a national care service will allow for that consistency, which ultimately will build public confidence that regardless of the bricks and mortar that their loved one is is in, regardless of where that care home is, that they know that it's the same standard, the same expectation um, for the care consistency. Now I know I've focused on on. Um, 
and home care specifically with that. Uh, but also, um, I think it's really important that um, unpaid carers need to have a greater voice. And I feel that as much as you may have specific team leaders that may be very good at their job, you may have specific teams that are very good at integration, because what you're doing in essence is slapping a plaster on something and just keeping it going, because I believe that the NHS has been over politicised for far too long. What we can do with a national care system is be bold and innovative in the way that we approach care to improve health outcome outcomes and to actually eliminate um, the, the inequalities that we see uh, in a modern day Scotland. And um, this is all part with, you know, the dealing with the poverty, dealing with those issues, dealing with the drug deaths. You know, we need to think bolder and bigger about it because what we're doing at the moment has its limits. So that's how yeah. we, that is what we can achieve in, in having that. Michelle, see on, in your constituency, which is West Scotland, and you must uh, doing the, the leaf lighting and your, your people they are maybe one to one. So do you think you have uh, they are fully convinced with the NHS services uh, by the Scottish government? Are they are they are looking more and more from the SNP to uh, from your side as a candidate? And uh, what do you think? Well, I've, because, because we are leaflet and obviously there is limited engagement, but I've had obviously been on the doorsteps before because I've campaigned heavily uh, for, for the SNP for years now. Um, now, there's no such thing as perfect. I'm not trying to dispute that. There are people who have had negative experiences and it's people who rightfully are very disgruntled about some things when they don't when they don't happen well and don't happen right. Jean Freeman made it very clear that she wanted, if there was issues in workplaces, her door was open and she wanted staff to make her aware of it as soon as possible because we, we're not buttoned up at the back. You know, we, we understand that it's not perfect. Um, however, when it comes to addressing and making people have confidence in the NHS, it's not as straightforward as just saying we are going to deliver. It's about how we're going to do that. Now, when it comes to devolution, I think opposition can be very keen to say, well, you have the field, you know, health is devolved. You, you have that right and choice. Yeah, but we don't have the full fiscal powers in order to marry it up. It's like a domino effect, in my opinion. So if we don't have the full fiscal range for us to be able to make our own decisions, to have the full tax raising powers, for us to not be able to decide fully because we don't know what our budget is going to be, because we always have to have an underspend. Now, there are people who will dispute that and say um, that if you look at it, the, uh, the, the SM, you know, under the SNP would be, you know, that the, the investment into public services would actually cause a deficit. No, the Scottish Government doesn't carry a deficit, it physically can't. There's an agreement in place because of devolution that you have to have an underspend. It's there on the Scottish Government website, you can go and read it um, if you don't believe me. It's all there to be seen in black and white. Um, you know, so having to always be very aware of the fact that you have the underspend and you can't borrow. I mean, look what happened when Kate Forbes was trying to help businesses out and she was asking for extra powers in order to allow for that to be facilitated. We were told no. So there's limits to what we can do. Those things are relevant to this conversation because if we really, really want to make a difference to the subcultures in Scotland, we need to be able to tailorise the care that we can deliver and do it with the government support that is required to, to have those levers in place. Um, procurement is a big part of it as well. Um, for, for anyone, I, I know it might sound like quite a laborious sub, subject matter, quite boring, but actually procurement and having positive procurement where we're able to uh, source things effectively, also looking at things in a greener perspective, because it can actually be a lot of waste, obviously, because we use a lot of single use items, um, which is required for sterile treatments, etc. That is required in certain procedures. but. Are we doing everything to our utmost to be as green as possible, to have procurement that has local sources attached to it, uh, that is ethical and within the frameworking? There's lots of things that we can look at that can make a difference to the way that we do healthcare. And the SNP is having those integral conversations. Um, and that is why we need a majority, because there's a difference between um, sort of having a majority and thinking that you're not held to account. You're 100% held to account by your opposition and ultimately by the voter at the end of the day. But by not having a majority, it means having to compromise. And that means that you can have policies and ideas and thoughts as to how you can best do things for the country, 
But if you've not got the votes to do it, then that means you've got to make a compromise to change it. And that means that other people who maybe think they're getting one idea don't get exactly what they thought was on the, what they were reading at the time. And that can be difficult. Michelle, my question is not as a candidate, as a NHS staff, what do you expect more from the, the, the Scottish government and you know, like from the party, particularly from your staff point of view? Are you expecting more or what things need to be done? It's the things that I've said before, which is to value staff. If you want to retain staff, you need to value staff. And that means investment in their career progression, true career progression, not going for a 30 minute course. that's just an update on health and safety. I'm talking about opportunities uh, and further development, which is things that the Scottish Government have done. Things like the Early Clinical Careers Fellowship, which I myself have benefited from, um, you know, which is that the allows for you to get postgraduate um, qualifications while you also build on your experiences as a practitioner and um, that has opened doors and opportunities for me to engage with a lot of senior members of management for me to learn how they have done things and for me to consider my own practices and build my own confidences too and um, so these sort of things make such a difference and also like I said having decent pay does go a way of making it but I don't think that I've always said that um, pensions are a huge part of that as well. We've got to remember pensions have changed over the years. Um, and part of why nurses always sort of accepted that their pay was maybe not quite what other professions maybe have is because they knew they were going to get a decent pension out of it. If you start to feel devalued, um, then you're going to be looking at the baseline, which is I'm here to just make my money. Whereas if you actually feel valued in your work, you have the pay that gives you the lifestyle that is reflective also of the responsibilities of the job that you're doing and you feel valued and integral to that system that will make a huge difference so it's not just about the baseline about money it's about investment into each part of our nhs it's about understanding the role of each and every department and for those that are under the agenda for change because that is what i've been i can comment on that because that's part of what i've been part of is that when agenda for change came in um, that didn't necessarily serve everyone great. If you were an E grade, because D's and E's were put into a band five, uh, if you're a nurse, um, then E grades were the ones missing out, and that had let that had, and that is where there was miscommunication um, from the the unions as well. So the, there's a lot of things that could have been done better, but it is where we are, and it's about how we take those next steps forward. And being in that framework and having seen how the cogs turn, I get it. I understand it. It's not perfect, but with a national care service, we have the opportunity to make that difference. And with the moves that the Scottish Government and the SNP at the helm will make all those differences. Will it be perfect? Probably not. Will it be absolutely uh, front and centre of making the difference? So for the majority, yes, it will. And where there are those situations where it doesn't quite work out, we will make sure that, we're, that the accountability is held from the opposition benches. I'm sure that they won't let that go. Right, thank you, Michelle. Uh, is Rosa still there? Okay. Michelle, uh, is there. <laughs> yeah, you are there. Uh, Michelle, you are there, so I don't want as you go. Uh, NHS, political parties, the competitive parties, are they using NHS as a card to win the election? Are uh, you know some some parties and some people are saying okay NHS uh, if I become uh, uh, if I, I if I'm winning the party if I become in, in a government so I can do this 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 so what do you think what is your stance what the SNP says what is the root plan for SNP if they become uh, they hold the majority of the of the of the seats on sixth of May so what would they do for SNP? Can I, sorry about that, I had some technical issues. Um, so uh, let's just like, I mean, I think we're we're looking very um, into our own just policies, but we have to look into the wider issue as well on NHS and what uh, we are being governed by a Tory government. And what they want to do is privatize our NHS. 
And that's something that the SNP is against, and we are against privatization, and we have and we have protected our NHS, and we have shown that within our policies. And I'm sure Michelle, uh, she works with, for the NHS, so she's gone into detail to explain all our policies. Um, but I think that's very important that we have mitigated from this Tory government and we're trying to stand up for the uh, Scottish people and making sure that our NHS is protected. But going back to your question, uh, that political parties uh, are using NHS in a way that uh, for their politics, really, uh, we're going to bring this investments and, you know, the Labour Party and the Tories saying things that um, they want to do, but when they were in government, uh, they didn't do these uh, action or policies that they want to bring forward. Uh, so I think we, we have to be uh, wary of what they are saying. Um, if the Tories want to uh, uh, invest in the NHS or want to uh, pay uh, uh, the NHS the uh, the right uh, of a pay increase, they should do it in England and they haven't done that and they've not shown that. So um, that's my kind of statement over uh, our NHS and I think we are uh, leading uh, the way on NHS and we've protected uh, uh, the NHS, but also made sure that, you know, waiting hours for emergency is down, uh, people can be seen in emergencies much quicker. These are all like uh, the, the Scottish government have actually implemented, so we, we receive a better service from our, our NHS. Right. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Rosa Saleh. Thank you very much. Uh, right. For the oncoming 6th of May, we are asking, urging people to vote, vote and vote for the parties, particularly the SNP party. So what is your comments? How do you tell, how do you motivate regarding the NHS point of view, regarding the health services point of view? In your last comments, how do you motivate them? What is your message for them? I suppose for, for me, to make it short, short and sweet, I know I'm not, I don't do it short very well. If you care about the NHS and if you care about really tackling poverty, inequality and knowing what a fair society is truly like, which I feel are core values for Scotland, you need to give both your votes to the SNP because ultimately it's us to deliver independence, it's us to deliver strong leadership through through Nicholas Sturgeon. And it's a strong and trusted voice that we need to steer through the acute phase of this virus before we can think about an independent referendum. And when it's time for us, it will be Scotland's choice to make that decision. And we are the only people that can be trusted to deliver that. Look at the polls, look what it's doing. And if you, as a person, are looking to be able to develop trust in a government where you may not have felt that before. It's the SNP that can deliver that. Thank you. My, sorry, yeah, my kind of last comment would be kind of the same thing. Um, we have invested in our NHS. We, our, we've Nicola Sturgeon have shown a strong leadership, have made sure that we recover from the pandemic. And, you know, it's because of the SMP we've done so well. And, you know, over 2 million people have already received the vaccination. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we want Scotland to recover from the pandemic. And then after that, we can ask the constitutional question about independence. And I think that must be clear to many people. We want to recover from pandemic, then ask the question on independence. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, in the end, I would like to say thank you very much uh, for coming, Michelle Campbell and Rosa Saleh and Fatima Joji. And I would like to say thank you to my special team who's looking after these, all these uh, the media correspondence and the live coverage streaming, Nakita Basi and my honorable, uh, the convener for this uh, SNP beam, Farah Farzana. 
It was very fantastic question and answer. And end of the day, the message is, as, as Nicola Sturgeon said yesterday, that was very, very fantastic remobilizing of the NHS. So she said very clearly, if you want experienced leadership and a serious government to guide Scotland through the pandemic and into recovery, and if you want a bold, progressive plan for government with the remobilization of the NHS at its heart, make both vote SNP. That's everything. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, Farah Fazana, would you like to say in the end, please? Just a wee quick thank you to everybody, especially our candidates, for taking time out of their busy schedules um, and their not normal traditional way of campaigning and canvassing. Um, and this indeed is a very different uh, kind of campaign and election than what we are used to. Um, so like I said, once again, thank you so much. And also to everybody who is viewing uh, as well and for your continued support. And it is about driving that message to say both votes need to be for the SNP. My personal thing that I, I'm seeing is that we need to have a diverse parliament. We have got amazing candidates that we've, you know, as an example of the, of the our candidates that we have online tonight. And we need to make sure that these guys have a seat in the Scottish parliament because these are the ones with the lived experiences, these are the ones with the professional experiences to make the policies that's going to affect the likes of me and you. So just on the back of that, hopefully uh, we'll get, tune in again next week for our next session. We're still going to decide on what the theme is going to be. Um, but no, thank you. And thank you very much to our host as well for the evening. Um, Thanks for organizing. Uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate the BEM network um, and for supporting all the candidates through this uh, election. So we really do appreciate it. Uh, I noticed that the hard work you do to organize meetings like this. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.